So hey everyone, welcome to our panel. Um, I finished applying for MFAs, what now? Um, and I said, PS, we're in a pandemic for a little bit of lighthearted humor here, um, but also obviously that's very serious um, and something that a lot of people have had various struggles with. And um, so I'm glad that you're able to make this call. Um, my name is Ishani Surya. Um, I went to the University of Arizona for fiction. Um, I have my contact information here. Um, that's my Twitter and Instagram handle, as well as if you have any follow-up questions or things you want to chat about, you can feel free to email me as well. Um, and I just want to introduce our awesome panel. Um, so I'm just going to ask them to go around, um, say their names and where they went to school, and also if they'd like to add any pronouns. Um, that they'd like to use during this call, please feel free. And we can just go in order of the list as it's here on this slide. Um, all right, hi, I'm Alana Lev Friedland. Um, I went to the University of Colorado Boulder, AKA CU Boulder. Um, and my pronouns are they, them, and theirs. Great, I'm Adam Ganusi. I went to UNC Wilmington and my pronouns are he, him. Hi guys, I'm Marcella Haddad, and um, I'm currently at UMass Amherst for fiction. I am Michelle. Can everybody hear me? Okay. I'm Michelle. I went to Brooklyn College, and my pronouns are she, her. Hi guys, I'm Olivia. I went. Or I go to UNC Wilmington. I'm graduating in a month, and my pronouns are she, her. Hey y'all, I'm Don Teal. I graduated from University of Wisconsin Madison, May 2018. My pronouns are she, her. And I'm Maddie Norris. Um, I'm in my last semester at the University of Arizona and my pronouns are she, her. Awesome, thank you panel. Um, so I just wanted to say why we're doing this panel. So we're of course in extraordinary and terrible times um, and we feel that it's harder to find support during this time. It can be tough to get in touch with faculty or mentors as everyone's kind of making do with what they can. Um, and there's a lot of uncertainty about what's to come. So we want to help you by providing a space to focus on your questions. Um, but we are also suggesting to continue to reach out to those mentors um, and get that specialized kind of advice. Um, also continue to reach out to the schools that you applied to and just find out a little bit more about their process if anything has changed now that schools are sort of in an online environment. And um, you know, be gentle with yourself regarding writing in the process, but doing that art whenever it helps. Um, but also being mindful of productivity culture and what that means. Um, and this panel is for everyone. So those who did get acceptances, those who ended up on wait lists, and those who didn't get the news that they wanted. Um, we're going to try to answer some questions that hopefully address concerns that everyone from those groups have. Um, and mostly we just want all writers to get the support that they need right now. Um, so we're going to get started with some questions that we gathered from different applicants as well as things that we thought might be useful to talk about and then we'll open up a space um, for you to ask questions in the chat and try to answer those. Um, so the first question is I didn't get into any programs. Um, what do I do? And I think that one of the concerns that can kind of come with that as well is am I a crappy writer and can I even make it without an MFA? Um, so Adam, we have you up to chat about this a little bit. Yeah, great. Uh, thank you. Um, yeah, you're not a crappy writer for that. I'm actually like kind of particularly passionate about this question because I went through three different application cycles and it, it you know, it, that definitely came up in my mind a number of times too when you're going three years, when we get into an MFA program, you know, really hungry to get into one and, and, and not getting into one too, trying to find the right fit with whether it's funding, whether it's finding one that um, like wants you to. Um, so just keep in mind that, you know, MFA programs, are extremely selective. They have alternating adcom committees too. So each year, you know, you might, you know, apply to the same school and get totally different readers. And you might get the same readers that, you know, because not just because they didn't accept you doesn't mean they don't really like your writing as well too. Um, I'm actually in a place in my life right now where I'm outside an MFA program and I can tell you with firsthand experience, the time after an MFA program is very similar to the time before an MFA program. We're all just trying to make writing like a, a Part of our lives and, and you're already a writer and nobody can take that away from you. Thank you, Adam. Um, Arcella, I'm gonna shoot that question to you too. 
Yeah, definitely. Um, so I was a two-time applicant and I had about two years in between um, my application cycles. That was like super valuable. Um, and it just felt really different applying again. So this is like on the side of if you're um, really passionate about the MFA, you feel like that's something you want to do. I think Adam really nailed it with like thinking about fit, that it's not just you trying to get into this selective like um, you know, sort of program, but also that you're trying to find a place that will be able to serve what you're trying to do in your work. And also I'm a like speculative genre writer. So even I, I came in, I was like, I'm probably going to apply a million times, you know, the MFA world might not even be for me. Um, and, uh, you know, it turns out here at UMass, like, it's great. We're experimental stuff like that. Um, so just keep in mind that, you know, in your application, being as sincere to your work and like what you want to do, that's what's actually going to get you into the programs that are a good fit for you. And so sometimes a rejection um, is definitely not always a good measurement of your skill or your level, but think about it as it's also a way to be like, you know, there aren't faculty right now at that program who are going to be able to help you with what you're doing if it's just not a match. So it's less about like, it's kind of a two way street, you know, you're trying to like find a place that will um, nurture you as a writer in the way that you are. And so just be really sincere in your application and um, be as weird or like go in the directions you want to go. That's what's going to help you get into the program that's actually a good match for you instead of trying to like play the game, if that makes sense. Yeah, thank you. And then Olivia, did you have anything to add there? Yeah, for sure. Um, thanks so much, um, uh, first of all, for organizing this. Um, second of all, I wanted to I guess piggyback on what Marcella said because I think that fit is really important and I'm a two-time applicant or two-time cycle um, I'm not sure how to say that um, I applied twice in two different cycles and the first time I applied to a school I thought was my dream school but I think I was really looking at prestige more than anything and I didn't get in and um, I think I should just say this now because it might be important to someone who's watching but i basically went to my program because of a specific person um which is interesting and i don't think i've heard that a lot from a lot of people so i thought i might mention it um i read this one book called bobcat by rebecca lee <laughs> um who is adams and my teacher a few years ago um she's still my teacher she's my thesis advisor and it worked out perfectly for me like she's the best mentor i could have asked for um and that kind of decision, that, that risk that I took worked out. I think it was a risk and I don't think that it always works out that the person you wanna work with ends up being a great teacher and a great mentor. Um, for me, it did. I'd be really careful about making the same decision I did, um, but that's the choice I made. Um, and I actually applied to only one place my first time around. And then I only applied to one place my second time around because I was determined to study with this person and at UNCW, and um, I didn't, I, I wasn't sure if I wanted to get an MFA at that point in my life um, in general. Um, I just knew that um, I really love this person's writing and I wanted to work with them. Um, but I had two goals. The first was to write a book. The second was to um, work with someone, this person, um, Rebecca Lee. <laughs> um, but definitely, like Adam said, um, if you don't get into a program, it's the same as if you get rejected from a publication. You're not a crappy writer. Everyone gets rejections all the time. And MFA rejection is just another rejection in the list of rejections you're going to get as a writer. Um, though I know it's like really disheartening um, when it happens. So I'm like, I wouldn't say to um, like feel the feelings you have, like it's okay to be devastated about it and grieve. A rejection like you don't have to feel um i don't know i guess i've been, been thinking a lot about feelings and how it's important that we don't please our feelings but um that's a whole other topic um i don't know if this was helpful at all <laughs> um or yeah i don't know if this is helpful but i hope i hope it was um it was helpful for me honestly <laughs> um, okay. thank you for for ending with that point about feelings and grief i think that's really important especially in this like time of world grief um as well I want to move to a question that is similar, but a little bit different. Um, I didn't get into my dream school, but I did get some offers. Should I go with another school or should I apply again? I'm going to send that one over to Alana Lev. Hi. Um, all right. So 
I'm not even going to name what my dream schools were, first of all, because they're like everyone's dream schools, <laughs> um, which is why they have very low acceptance rates. So don't feel bad if you didn't get into them. You're in great company. Um, what's it called? Um, I was at a point where I feel like conventional wisdom or like if I had kind of listened to the overwhelming draft majority, the advice would have been don't take the offer, um, work on your writing, try again. Um, and the things that led me to not do that were, um, I guess I'll try and uh, narrow it down to two things. Um, one was just timing. Um, I was in a point in my life where I needed to, pardon my language, get the fuck out of Boston. Um, I'm, I'm now back. I, I don't feel that way anymore, but um, I, I was just like ready to get out. <laughs> um, and um, what is it called? So it was like, uh, the timing was right, I wanted to go. Um, the other thing is I did have kind of like three people in my life where I was like, if these people give me the go ahead, um, I am on board. It is like, you're like a, a mentor, a, a friend, another mentor. Like if, if those people who know my work, who know yeah, me think that this is a good idea, I'm, I'm on board with um, going there. Um, and I feel like this is also going to bleed into the rankings and prestige stuff. Um, so I'm going to just, uh, I'm going to just, um, stop there. Um, I will, uh, quickly echo some things that people have said, which is that fit is a thing. Like my school ended up being, um, I used to say, uh, creatively, aesthetically, academically, politically, like uh, my school is a really good fit for me. But like, if I had just been, uh, thinking of my dream school, I, I wouldn't have ended up and wouldn't have ended up going. There we go. Yeah. Thank you so much. And we'll talk a little bit more about like prestige and a follow-up question. Um, Michelle, I wanted to, to send this question your way. Yeah. So I, uh, didn't get into my dream school. I remember being so crushed at the time and really thinking that um, I remember before the I got any acceptance or rejection letters thinking like I'm not gonna let it get into my head um, and then it totally got into my head and I wasn't sure what to do if I should apply for another round and for me the decision came down to a few things I thought about why was this school my dream school and um, it came down to me getting sucked me believing the hype, so to speak. Um, I was really, uh, the idea of studying with certain professors was really intriguing to me. Uh, the idea of a certain name was really intriguing to me. But when I actually thought about it, the school wasn't a fit for me. The alumni, um, I, their work didn't align with my work. Um, even the professors that I thought that I so badly wanted to study with, I wasn't even a huge fan of their work. Um, I just knew their name. They were famous writers. I thought that that sounded really incredible to, um, to study under them. And I'm a little bit embarrassed to even admit this. And I wound up sitting in on a workshop for the school, Brooklyn College, that I wound up going to and was just blown away. And I understand getting the circ given the circumstances, um, you won't be able to sit in a workshop. Um, but for me, once I sat in that workshop, I realized, oh, what I thought was my dream school actually isn't my dream school at all. The things that I think I want from an MFA program, um, I, I maybe need to realign what makes a dream school a dream school. So if you didn't get into a dream school and you are absolutely crushed, question why it's your dream school. Maybe it's your dream school for the right reasons and you do want to wait another year and apply, or maybe it's not. And maybe um, it's ultimately not a good fit for you. Yeah. Thank you so much. And, and, Going off of that, um, if people do want to apply for a round, another round, what should they think about? And I'll hit you with that one, Adam. Yeah, okay. So you want to continue to be productive as a writer, and that can take all sorts of different ways, but uh, look different ways. But the, the main thing is you want to feel within yourself that you're moving forward. Um, and that could be, you know, reading a bunch. That could be reading a bunch of lit mags that you're, you're, you haven't been before. You kind of, you know, expanding what you're familiar with. That could be applying to be a reader at a number of literary magazines too. Like a lot of these lit mags, they don't require an MFA to be, you know, a part of, you know, participating in, in that publication too. You're going to build relationships doing that. You're going to be exposed to a lot of um, 
you know, new kinds of writing. Um, there's all sorts of workshops outside of MFA programs too, whether they're kind of independently run or whether they're um, continuing studies classes. I took a number of continuing studies classes. Uh, you get an interesting mix of people in these classes. You get a lot of people that they might be writing their first story, their first poem, but they're also people that have lived like really interesting lives. A lot of them are older folks that have, you know, a lot of experiences and really nuanced perspectives about stuff that can help you um, when revising your own stories as well too. Um, so uh, another thing too, the final thing I'd say too, is, is set yourself up with some deadlines. Have people, you know, a friend, doesn't need to be a writer even, that's gonna hold you accountable to produce and meet these kind of deadlines as well too. I love it. Um, and then Marcella, do you have anything to add to this? Yeah, definitely. Um, I noticed such a difference on my second round of applying. Um, and like Adam said, that um, being productive as a writer and learning how to do that on your own is such a valuable skill after the MFA, during the MFA, if you never get an MFA. So the time you take to learn how to produce work regularly at the rate that you that's comfortable for you to write at that's gonna serve you no matter what. So you should be doing that anyway in between applications. Um, but another thing, you know, the dreaded personal statement um, felt so different to me writing it the second time. And what I realized is because I gathered uh, language to articulate like my own aesthetics and my own purpose in my writing is what I gained in between applications. Um, so like Adam said, like reading is such an important part of that. Um, you know, even if you can't read for a lit mag, just to read publications and to read work you're interested in. I found um, interviews with writers to be a really helpful way to, un to like find this kind of language. Um, how to talk about your own work in really specific ways. That's a good place if you're working on a personal statement. And um, I just felt like I got to the point where I was really able to say by my second application, here's what I've done, here's where I'm stuck, and where I want this program to like help me, um, you know, fill in these blanks or close this gap. Um, and so you really, it, it's really different feeling when you're able to say that very specifically for yourself, like, why do you want to go to this program and what is happening in your work that you want this program to be a catalyst for? So I think waiting for that moment. And again, like I waited two years, I was, I kind of doing a lot of work in that time. But then when I was working on that second round, I really felt ready and I could really say like, here's what I want out of this. Um, that makes sense. Thank you so much. Um, and I just want to say that um, there is a question in the chat um, from Rona. Thank you so much, Rona. And then it looks like oh, I just answered it. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Um, so I love this. Um, I think what we'll probably do is answer some of these questions also at the end. So if you guys want to be having some conversation in the chat, that's totally great. Um, but we'll run through the questions that we have prepared and then revisit some of these in the chat as well. Um, so our next question um, that we had prepared was also about wait lists. Um, so some people are on wait lists and how do they handle that along with the offers that they may have gotten already or if they don't have offers in hand. Um, and I'm going to ask Maddie to answer that question. Yeah, so um, I was waitlisted for my dream school, which is Arizona, and I ended up here, which is great. Um, but I had another couple of other offers. One I decided I didn't want to go to and another one I was going to take if I didn't get in off the wait list. Um, so that school actually had an earlier deadline than most schools, the April 15th deadline. So I ended up taking that initial offer and Arizona called me on April 15th and was like, we want you. And I was like, oh, I want to come. Um, so just the first thing is that if you accept an offer and then a dream school comes through, um, it's not great, but you can break that initial contract. That's something that is done and it's hard, but people also understand like Arizona was a better financial package for me. Um, it made more sense with my writing. Like it was just a better offer. So um, yeah, that's a possibility. I also want to say too, with waitlist being at Arizona, I found out that um, if you're on a wait list and you really want to come to the school and uh, you should make that clear to the school. So um, I found out that people who visited actually got bumped up the wait list um, in the past, which I did not realize. 
And obviously that's not a thing right now. Visiting is not happening, but definitely email the school and let them know that you're interested because they want to offer, if you're on the wait list, they obviously like your writing and they want to offer spots to people who really want to come. So I would just say, um, talk to the school and let them know about your interest. Thanks, Maddie. Um, Marcella, what thoughts do you have on this one? Yeah, definitely ditto that. Let the school know you're interested. And also, this is to people who maybe only have a wait list or only have a few wait lists. Um, one, know that it's um, the same amount of like acknowledgement of your work as an acceptance. It's absolutely the same. Like, um, you know, when they narrow down the 2% of writers that they like out of hundreds or thousands, it's like you made the cut and it's so marginal, that difference between waitlist and acceptance. So you should definitely celebrate it so much and don't ever like treat it as like half an exemption like that, like celebrate your writing. Secondly, um, you should act, not act as if an, it's an acceptance, but you need to gather as much information as you can to make your decision as soon as possible. Because like Maddie, outside a situation where I was like actually April 16th, at the call because it was like a national holiday here in uh, Massachusetts, the 15th, it sucked. Um, <laughs> but you want to be able to like pull the trigger once you get that call. So you um, shouldn't wait to do your info gathering. You might feel nervous, but you're absolutely welcome and a part of the community. So you should be contacting current students, asking to visit. Don't feel like, oh, I'm not good enough. Like, because I was only waitlisted, like do everything as if you were like an accepted student to gather information about that school so that when they do get back to you, because it might be really late, you have your answer for sure, yes or no, and you don't have to go collecting other information. So be gathering info and celebrate it just as much as an acceptance. Some great advice there. Oh, um, wait, that one I do have something to add to for about oh, yes, please. Yeah. So waitlist, um, Let's say you're in a situation where you have a wait list, but you also have some acceptances. And let's say that wait listed school is the school that you want to get into. Um, I think that it is, an, is a really good idea to keep in contact with the school that you're wait listed in about acceptances that you have or acceptances that you get as the process is going on. Because that was really helpful to me. I'll talk about this a little bit more when we get to the prestige stage of it. But um, definitely anytime I got like a new acceptance to school that I really wanted to go to that I was wait listed at, I would email and just be like, hey, you know, and I had a really, um, really communicative um, person who was emailing me, so that that helps too. But I was just like, hey, just let you know, I, I got into this school. And I think that that also kind of put some heat under them a little bit, you know what I mean? Because I got like some pretty good, like, um, fellowship packages once I was accepted into the school officially. So I'm just saying, so keep in contact. It's not, it doesn't make you look weird. It's not like a weird thing to do. This is all kind of like, normal and expected you want to like weigh your offers like hey guess what i'm wanted i'm wanted other places too so you want me too and it's all helpful so just make sure to do that stuff thank you don Taylor. and actually i'm gonna just call on you again because we're on that <laughs> rankings and prestige um question so how do rankings and prestige play into choosing a program um you know so my first my application cycle i applied one time but was in 2015 and i didn't know i didn't have a writing community i learned everything that i know about programs through draft on you know facebook so that was actually a really helpful resource for me but um i would say don't get caught up in prestige i would say that you need to like put prestige aside and then think about what will this program offer me because it's not just like it's, it's really easy to get caught up in feeling like grateful for being accepted into programs, but no one's investing time and money into you for, for no return. You know what I mean? They're getting you being an awesome writer and like going out into the world, you know, putting your writing out there as a return investment. And then, you know, like you're the mascot for their school and their program. So um, as far as that, like, I guess what programs can offer you in terms of preparing you for your life after the MFA is way more important than prestige. So the school I was waitlisted at was University of Wisconsin-Madison, um, and I had outright gotten into um, Iowa's Writers Workshop. So for a lot of people, when I was like, oh, I got my acceptance letter, you know, people were like, well, that's a no-brainer. That's a no-brainer. You go to Iowa, except for it's really not a no-brainer because, yes, Iowa's the big name. Everybody, like, even non-writers know, like, Iowa, you know, Writers Workshop. However, and this might go into later when we're talking about um, cohort size and all of that stuff, but it's like, will I get the same amount of investment and attention at Iowa as I will at Wisconsin, which, you know, so be thinking about that, not even just, and, and, and honestly, I didn't even know like any of the faculty when I was applying, what was most important to me was how much money they were going to give me, what was the teaching load and like 
will I actually have time to write without having to like get a side job? Um, so I would say prestige only matters when you start talking about stuff like, do they do agent visits and you know, that kind of stuff. But even smaller programs can do that kind of stuff. So don't get caught up in it. Don't be like, oh, I'm going to Iowa just because, because if you're going to Iowa and they're giving you $10,000 versus somebody who's going to Iowa and they're getting, you know, a 25,000 no teaching package, that's very different. Those are gonna be very different experiences. Yeah, thank you. Um, Michelle? Yeah, I think that there's so many things that you have to look at. And I think ranking into prestige um, should be on the low end of the list. I got into a few different schools and two of those schools were ranked higher than uh, Brooklyn College, where I wound up going. First off, I feel like these rankings are so subjective. I don't even really know what necessarily they're based on just because a school is in a top five MFA program doesn't mean at all that it's a right fit for you. For me, I wound up turning down one of the more prestigious programs um, because it was out of New York and I realized pretty early in the application process, um, I was living in New York at the time and I just decided, okay, what space do I want the MFA to take up my life? I realized I didn't wanna to have to quit my job. I realized I didn't wanna to have to, I was living with my partner at the time. I didn't want to have to um, uproot our entire lives. So that was a no brainer. And then another program um, based in New York that was decided by whoever decides these things that was more prestigious than the program I wound up going to. Um, I learned that it was really, really competitive. I spoke to a few people who had gone there and had said, you know, some of the professors are really sexist. They said that there was just um, uh, jealousy really defined the program. People were really awful to one another in and out of workshop. And I knew that that wasn't the experience I wanted. I knew that I wanted to go to an MFA. I wanted to get my MFA because I wanted to get better at writing. I wanted to finish a book. And I also wanted to find a community of writers. Um, so I, at the end of the day, I wound up not caring that that school, those schools were ranked higher. They didn't make sense for my life. They didn't make sense for what I wanted. Um, so yeah, rankings and prestige really don't matter. You want to have a school that's going to be, um, there, there are MFA programs out there that are sort of cash cows for universities, yeah. um, okay. and just really aren't legitimate. So that's a separate issue. You want a program where the professors are taking it seriously. The students are taking it seriously. Um, but you don't need a program that has, um, the fanciest professor or is on some list that publishers weekly made. Um, that's not important. How do we um, figure out which of those programs are sort of those cash cow programs? Are you having to pay to go? That's, that's a big indicator. Mm -hmm. Don't go into debt for this MFA. This is like writing is already like an industry where nothing is guaranteed to you. Like the MFA is not going to help that at all. I mean, like, okay, lies. I mean, there's some networking involved. Maybe there's some connections that you can make. There's, you know, maybe a couple of little things like that. But as far as like, you know, an MFA can't guarantee you that you're going to, um, you know, sell a book and have a book come out. They cannot do that. Um, so if you're having to pay to go, if you're having to take out loans to go, um, maybe that's a little cash cow <laughs> Yeah. yeah. Um, or can I um, add something? Ah. Or if MFA programs are making false promises to you. Like if they're saying... Things like 90% um, of our students walk away with an agent or if they're really trying to give you this idea that, oh yeah, within five years, most of our students get a debut novel. Um, no school can promise those things. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean that that school's a cash cow, but those might be some of the red flags you wanna look out for. Yeah. Could I hop in with a red flag? Yes, please do. I was actually gonna toss this one to you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so another thing to look out for, and um, I only know about this with regards to like one specific, if you have a way to figure out if, um, I know of a program where they have like big names as the faculty, but then mm -hmm. adjuncts are primarily teaching the classes. I suspect that that's that way as well at some of the other, um, at some of the other cash cow programs. So just kind of be, um, just be wary of that thing one. Um, thing two, I think my esteemed panelists have already kind of covered a lot of, um, like, no, rankings and prestige don't really play so much of a, a role. Um, those rankings, I think the one that people tend to reference were made in 2012. Yeah. From, like, <laughs> question, <laughs> born in question, questionable methodologies. Um, so, uh, I will say, I guess, uh, on kind of, like, two 
streams, whatever, um, just remember, you, like, you're li living somewhere, so you have to take into account, like, the logistics of living. So, like, for me, part of when I said that, like, I was ready to leave Boston, so I... I was already thinking of maybe moving to Colorado. Um, I used to work for like a, a national chain restaurant that has a loca has locations there. I have family there. Um, it just like sounded like a very different kind of vibe from Boston, and I wanted some. I wanted. I needed to hit that reboot. Um, also on the logistics front, um, honestly. I so you have had really good health insurance. Mm -hmm. um, they also have like very like trans affirming health insurance. They had really good mental health coverage, um, and their um, their uh, contracts cover like the the um, majority of your health insurance. Like coming back into the real world, I was like, <laughs> I miss that. Um, um, but yeah, just like remember, you're a person. Um, so be looking out for those logistic things as uh, log uh, things as well. Um, and then on the other side of things, um, fit, fit, fit. So like um, for me, for example, um, if folks were on early, I said I'm a, I'm an experimental poet, but um, my school is also really good for like speculative fiction or and also like things that exist in between beyond like I was admitted as a poet but like my particular program you don't have to take any part like you can be admitted as a poet and then take nothing but fiction genres uh, fiction workshops and then write some like hybrid um thesis and it's completely fine um like me for example I was admitted as a poet did mostly poetry workshops wrote a fiction hybrid thesis um so it's also good to know know that if you are someone who like wants to get to play with different um the uh different genres um going to a program that's going to support that um and i'll just like throw out like one other random thing that i did was like i'm also really interested in performance art and given the kind of like experimental nature across all of cu's mfa programs like they have film dance um visual art like all have that kind of um experimental aesthetic so I knew that like if I wanted to do this weird thing there would be faculty support for it. Awesome um so we're gonna switch into talking a little bit about money which I know that we've kind of touched on already um but Santiel could you talk a little bit about does funding really matter that much and what should I look into in regards to funding? Me personally 100% money was my first am I going to be able to live off of this? Because the whole point of the MFA going to an MFA is to, you know, people are like, oh, it's a bubble. It's not the real world. That's the whole point. It's, it's a bubble. It's supposed to insulate you for two to three years or, you know, four if you're doing Alabama. Um, you know what I mean? It's supposed to insulate you for that time so that you have like a timeout to like sit here and work on your craft and focus on your thing. So yes, 100% for me and for people who don't like have spouses or parents or some other kind of, you know, money independent from that. Yes, 100%. And it's not just so does funding really matter that much it's what 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 are they ask what are they giving you for funding but think about how that stretches out in terms of a year don't just think of it in terms of semester because there's the summer too so some programs give you enough money to like cover you over the summer so you're not having to like get a job over the summer um what i sh what should i look into in terms of funding um so funding matters as far as what your stipend is are you getting health care health care is always big um are you going to get money to travel to conferences or you know that kind of thing like that um I'm trying to think yes but that's that's the long and short of it is can i survive off of this money without having to get a side hustle or you know not have to work as much on the side hustle because it kind of defeats the purpose if you're having to work just as hard in the mfa on top of you know you, it kind of defeats the purpose mm -hmm. if i yeah. could just piggyback off that real quick like yeah. i feel like like what Dante was saying um, in the MFA, you want your mindset to be writing is my full-time job, even above teaching. So when you're doing the math and you're looking at your budget, maybe you have a second job, maybe you have a side job, but you're training your brain to not feel guilty about writing, to prioritize writing. And so like, that's what the relationship to money is. Do you have enough that you're not stressed about it? And that like the time you spend writing, you can attach that to like your survival and yeah, so that's just how I think of oh, it. Oh, yeah, 100%. You might not, I mean, it's still grad school money, so you're not going to be living lavishly, you know what I mean? But, like, enough to where you're like, okay, I'm, I'm comfortable at least. I can, like, actually focus on being here and doing, you know, getting everything I'm supposed to be getting out of this program. Because also teaching is a whole thing. So if you like teaching and side hustling, that's, we'll get into that one later. But, yeah. 
Yeah, absolutely. I'm actually going to jump on this question a little bit as well. Um, so I did work a second job while I was in my MFA, um, but I did not need to. Um, it was because it was an opportunity that I was really interested in. I was writing for an app. I was using my writing skills for a tech company um, and doing choose your own adventure stories. And I was like, this is a weird, cool job and I want to try this. Um, and that was fine in the sense that I knew that there was a reason that I was taking this job and it wasn't just to like fund my living. Um, it was because I was actually interested in that work. I'm um, interested to see and how it might add to my process differently. The other thing that I wanted to say about funding is I do think about equity of funding a lot across the program. So there may be situations in which um, you're not able to take a position where everybody in the program is getting the same amount of money. But if you are able to, I think it can really change the dynamic of the program to know that people are not competing for funding while they're there, but that everyone is getting the same thing and in the same place um, in terms of the funding that they're getting from the program. Now, obviously, whatever money and support they're getting outside of the program can still be different. Does anyone else have anything to add um, before we move on to the next question? I was going to say that's a really good point about the equal funding thing, because there's already going to be so many things. I mean, because, you know, it, it's natural to sometimes feel envious of other people and other writers. I mean, that's just a natural thing. But if you take like funding out of the situation, you know, there's a lot less for that to like happen while you're in your program. You know what I mean? So that definitely does make a difference. Yeah. Um, and then a question that kind of goes with that is how can someone ask for money in a more professional way from a school? So Michelle, could you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. So I wound up asking for more money from Brooklyn College and I got it. Um, and I was just really upfront with the program director, Joshua Henkin. I was as honest as possible um, while being professional and being respectful. And I explained the circumstances. I said, um, here are the schools that I've been accepted to. Some of the schools had given me more money. Um, I said, I really, really love Brooklyn College. This was after I had sat in on a workshop. Josh also has an accepted students party every year. Um, and I just realized, oh, this is such a great fit for me. Um, and, but with the original package I was given, I would have to take out a loan. And I knew, especially if I was going to stay in New York, that I was not taking out a loan for my MFA. And... So Josh, I sent an email to Josh saying that, and uh, he got on the phone with me, and um, he asked, what would it take for you? How much money would you need to come to the program? And I said, I need to think about that, and I'll get back to you. Um, I really encourage anyone, if you talk to your program director, to use that line. It's okay to say, I need to think about that and get back to you. Um, you are not required to give them a number if they ask that question. Um, and only tell them the information that you're comfortable telling them. You can say, you can name the names of the schools you got into. Um, sometimes depending on what those schools are, it can put more pressure on them. Um, but I just really recommend being as honest as possible saying, listen, I love this program, but here's my financial situation. I don't wanna have to take out loans. What can be done? And you'll be surprised. Usually something can happen, um, it really can. And again, just the same as like keeping in contact with schools about other schools you got into, it's a totally normal and okay thing to do to be honest about what your financial needs are. And you never know until you ask the question, right? So if they say no, I mean, then that's what you know, and you can factor that in your decisions. But I agree with Michelle, asking, asking. This, this whole writer life is going to be you kind of negotiating your worth, like in, in your writing's worth and, you know, and your, and your living and how, and how you live. So it's just good to get comfortable doing that. Love it. Great advice there. Thank you. Um, so one thing that I'm actually going to jump on is this question of stretching a stipend, especially if someone can't work part-time. Um, so as I mentioned, like I did work part-time and I found it useful. Um, and this question came up from someone in draft and I thought about it a lot because I was trying to think of all the different ways that um, this was possible. And I think it really boils down to a couple things. Trying to figure out if there is outside funding, um, if there's some kind of organization that can fund you or things like that, that's gonna require some work on your part, getting those grants and seeing if they can be available year after year. 
The other thing is taking a look at your budget. So if you're in a situation where you're, let's say, like working a job where you make $80,000 a year, <laughs> good for you. Um, but you're, you're going to have to recognize that your budget is a little bit different when you're on a grad school stipend and see like, are there places where I can move money around, cut, et cetera, et cetera. But the thing I want to say is that if you're at a point where there is a school and they're offering you a stipend and you've looked at the cost of living of the place and it's not livable, that school might be one that you have to reconsider or ask for more money, reapply to other places, things like that. Because ultimately, as I think some of the panelists have said, um, taking out loans or not being able to make it during those couple of years is going to take a, a lot away from your experience of being in grad school. And it's going to add stress that isn't going to be great for your craft. Does anyone else have anything to add about this question before we move on? No? Okay. Um, perfect. So we're going to talk a little bit about teaching, which I know is a huge um, question for a lot of people. And I have a couple of panelists who are going to speak about it. So um, what should I know about teaching? How will it factor into my MFA experience, especially if I'm looking at offers where one program has more teaching and one program has less? Um, Maddie, do you mind speaking to this one? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so one of the things I would say to consider is why are you going to the MFA? Um, if it's for more time to write, then that's one thing. That's a very common answer, right? Um, if a side reason is because you want to go into academia and you want to teach, then that is also important to know. So if you want to teach afterwards, it's incredibly important to get teaching experience in the MFA. So um, I would say that we should go to, you know, you should go to a program that offers you that opportunity. Um, and specifically, if you can teach in creative writing instead of just composition classes, that's important. Um, but if you don't really care about teaching, then um, yeah, there are a couple of things that I'll say, and I'll try to be quick because I know other people are going to talk about this as well. Um, but yeah, you're coming to an MFA primarily to write, so that should be your priority, um, and you should fit teaching in around your writing. So I like literally schedule my writing time, and then I fit everything else around that in my schedule, um, including teaching. So you need to come in knowing that it's not going to be a priority. Um, and yeah, I think that's all I'll say for now is that it just doesn't need to be a priority, and it probably shouldn't be. Thank you, Maddie. Um, so next up we have Michelle on this one. Yeah, um, I agree with everything that Maddie said. I also want to say that um, teaching is a lot of work, so keep that in mind. Um, I also would ask your program about what opportunities, if any, there are to teach after you graduate. So something I actually didn't know when I applied to Brooklyn College was that they guarantee, they don't like to use that word because um, in case, uh, whatever, they don't like to use that word, but they really do guarantee teaching for three to five years after you graduate, which is huge. It's been so great for me to, uh, I graduated in May and have been teaching ever since. Um, and I know that I had that job stability. Um, I don't know why they don't advertise it more actually, but that was a huge game changer for me. But I don't teach workshop, I teach comp. And I will say I didn't really feel like I had the tools to know how to teach comp. Um, I had to take one pedagogy class, but suddenly I was like teaching students how to do an MLA works cited page. And I was like, I don't even know if I remember how to do this. Um, so keep in mind that uh, teaching, I sort of, it's a huge responsibility. Um, I absolutely love it. I love the students that I get to teach. I think that they're, awesome and uh, it really fulfills my writing to teach, but um, don't think that it's just something that you can sort of do as a side hustle to get money. One, the money's not great, but if you're looking uh, for just like a job where you clock in and clock out, I don't recommend teaching. Yeah, thank you. Um, Olivia? Hey, yeah. Um, so I've been teaching for three years at UNCW now, and I kind of wanted to echo what Marcel, oh, sorry, Maddie and Michelle said. Um, first of all, that it's good for job, teaching is good for jobs afterwards. Um, even if you go into the MFA thinking you don't want to teach forever, um, in case you change your mind, which I have done my third year, um, I'm now applying to teaching jobs, mostly like middle and high school, actually. Um, and I don't think I would have a 
chance if I hadn't been teaching, um, I, I might have, I might not, um, but it definitely helps. Um, but teaching was not something I thought I would wanna do forever. The reason I said, or the reason I um, taught was because it offered more money than not teaching. So um, that's at least like an, the initial like impetus for me to teach. And then I realized I really liked it. Um, but our program is kind of, I don't know if other programs are similar, but um, TA ships um, was kind of like the best deal for me in terms of going here. So I, I knew that that was something I wanted. Um, sorry, my cat. Um, and then I also want to echo what Michelle said, which is that teaching is not a breeze. Um, it's really hard and it, it is a big responsibility because you think about what you owe these students and um, what they're paying for, for you to teach them. And um, the fact that they basically consider you to be a professor or consider you um, to have the same amount of knowledge that your own professors have, which we all know that we don't have that experience, but to them, it's like the same thing as like having another professor. Um, so it's a lot of responsibility and they, they hold you in high regard. And, um, or hopefully. Um, and then I guess the metaphor I would think of is, my first year was kind of difficult because I was teaching and because it was so hard. And it was kind of like, like, I guess I would say jumping into cold water. Like it was, um, it was kind of a shock and it definitely kind of affected my writing my first year, just because I was getting so adjusted to teaching. And that was a big part of like my brain. Like it was taking up a lot of my mind space. Um, so that's something to think about as well, because it does take up, if not your time, then just, what you think about. Like you think about the students, you think about your responsibility um, and that takes up a lot of like internal or it takes, it takes up a lot of energy. Yeah, definitely. Um, and then can we just have Marcella weigh in on this one? Yeah, definitely. I mean, first to echo uh, Maddie, like, you know, I came into the MFA actually like I was already teaching before that. I want to teach afterwards and it is a terminal degree. So if you're interested in working for like these writers workshops or camp stuff like that, um, not only having this degree, but the teaching experience itself is really important. So I was actually looking for programs where I would get the opportunity to teach. Um, the other thing too, for those of you who are worried about it, who have never taught before, um, one, it definitely is a feedback loop. I feel like instead of being too bubbly, like in your MFA bubble, this chance to interact with undergrads and see the creative new stuff they're doing is so refreshing. It's such a like fun part of the week that really connects you to the world outside of your writing in actually like a really positive way. As far as workload, um, you know, students going into MFA, I really encourage you to, um, you know, you're going to have the curriculum and requirements to work with, but also really, really interrogate your own um, misconceptions about teaching or your own standards, especially in terms of grading. That's what takes up a lot of time. And sometimes it's actually more effective to give students like two or three main points on their essay instead of commenting on every single line. And we kind of have this stuff ingrained from high school or from how we are as students. Like if we were particularly um, really intense students, then we kind of expect um, everyone to want that. But come in and you'll find that you can support the majority of your students by being available, by giving them resources and not by holding their hand so much. Um, so just doing a lot of thinking about your own um, pedagogy and um, not just resting on like what happened to you in college or what the curriculum is, but actually interrogating how you can help people. Um, it's not always going to be by being involved in every single aspect of the class, but by empowering them as writers. So it's, it's always worth putting some thought into that and it's going to save you some time and um, yeah, just beef up your teaching. Thank you so much, everyone. There's some really good thoughts. There are different perspectives on teaching and actually um, I'm thinking about putting together a panel on teaching in the summer because I think there's so much to talk about here. Um, I do want to kind of give us a time check just for everybody who's in this call. So we had talked about doing about an hour. We're at the hour mark now. Um, I know that the panelists are aware that we were going to go over and go an extra half hour. So we'll keep going with some of these questions. Um, I'm seeing you guys put questions and answers in the group chat, which is awesome. And I would encourage you to keep doing that because our panelists who aren't speaking are able to answer some of those questions um, at the same time. So it's a great way for us to keep continuing those conversations. Um, 
So one thing we're gonna move into talking about is some, sort of the logistics of programs. Um, so what are some of the pros and cons of a larger cohort or program versus a smaller one? Um, and I'm actually gonna ask Alana to talk about this one. Perfect. All right, so this is one where I am most likely going to be an outlier slash I very much hope that I'm an outlier on this, but um, uh, having prefaced that, um, so I went to a small program um, uh, I, I did go to, um, I guess, an unevenly funded program where they only guaranteed three poets and three fiction writers funding, but there were additional people accepted um, uh, who weren't 100% guaranteed. Um, some of them did have, uh, like, on a semester by semester basis, but um, so a small cohort, mine was actually seven people, and um, well, I've heard that at bigger programs, like, are... I, I chose it because I had heard at bigger programs you can kind of get lost and I did want that individual attention. Um, I've also heard about like cliques potentially forming um, at larger programs and I will say that um, the thing I alluded to by the end of my program like I I was like I did not I, like there was one person left in that program that I still like and talk to um, and I like desperately wished that I had gone to a larger program. Um, I will say that like a cool thing about being smaller is you do get to know everyone's work pretty well, um, which, you know, good thing, bad thing. Um, so it's like, oh, hey, Steve's the one who does the cool, uh, like fantasy with really clean prose and, um, da -da -da. um, what is it called? So yeah, I guess prose would be like, you do, it is easier to get more individual attention, um, when, when things were going well, it was like, oh, we were tightly knit, um, I guess like, with anything, it can kind of depend on who your cohort is. Um, cons were the cohorts are small. So if you don't like those people, you are kind of, um, uh, it, it can be interesting, um, which is why just as a, as a general thing, um, just like keeping, like my program is housed in the English department. So I actually ended up mostly hanging out with English PhDs by the end of it. Um, and just like be on the lookout for other student populations on campus because like your world does not have to be your MFA program ex especially if your MFA program is like like 20 people max. Yeah um, and actually a really great question in the chat is what we're talking about when we mean small and large. So Lana do you mind just defining for yourself what small and large meant uh, sure. So, um, uh, what is it called? I'm actually not 100%. <laughs> That's a great question. Um, see, I kind of apl applied to a range of sizes because I could see pros and cons with them. Um, I also uh, mostly avoided applying to the Midwest because I'm from there and just really did not want to go back. So, I know Iowa, is Iowa the one that's like 50 per cohort or is it 20, 25? Um, so, I guess I mean, like I'd say like... Opera. 25 per genre, okay. Um, geez, I guess I'd say, uh, how audible is that dog? <laughs> Sorry, okay. Um, so I'd say if it's like under five people per genre, um, especially if it's only poetry and fiction is what I would consider small. I don't know if the, the other panelists would, would consider that as well. Um, perfect, well, I'll, I'll move that question over to Marcella, and Marcella, if you could talk a little bit about what that size means to you in your mind as well. This is uh, the number one thing I wish I'd considered more when applying, um, and the reason for that is it's like the most important part of the program now that, um, in like a good way. So I'm at UMass Amherst, and we admit about 10 in each genre, um, poetry and prose each year. Um, so for three years, a grand total of about 60 students. So it definitely doesn't feel that big. First on the faculty note, I feel that the faculty is so available still. I don't think you necessarily miss out on being close with the faculty just because it's a bigger program. Um, as with everything, it's what you make of it. So it's so easy to set up an independent study. Um, workshops are capped, you know, so you, you're still getting um, that experience. And um, they're still very available as much as you want them to be. But I feel like such a value of the MFA is this community of writers who are at similar points in their career as you. Um, and I feel that most of the support I've gotten has been from like my friends here. We have like submission Sundays and we'll like write together. We'll exchange work outside of class. We'll exchange work over break. Um, 
and we're just doing similar stuff where we're kind of at similar stages in um, just our writing and our careers. And so um, the other cool thing too is that every new class I take, I meet new people, which is amazing. And there are certainly groups, um, maybe cliques, but you know, just like friend groups, people who tend to hang out together, but they're not impassable in any sense of the word. Like, again, you know, just having a class with someone, then you can't help but hang out and continue to discuss stuff outside of class. And I feel like you only gain new writers to your circle and to your friend group um, instead of like switching them or trading them. So um, I'm just so glad I ended up at a place this size. I think we're considered maybe a medium size. Um, it's been the best part of the experience and like one of the values that I know will continue after the MFA is just like these fellow writers who I get to meet and talk with and we can really do what we want, you know, outside of class and, and read each other's work. So highly recommend medium size. Yeah. That's awesome. Do any of our other panelists have anything to add before we move on? No? Okay, perfect. Um, so the next thing that I wanted to talk a little bit about is the difference in experience between a two-year and a three-year program. I know that there are also some programs that are one year or four years, but because these are the very common lengths for MFA programs, that's how I chose um, using two-year versus three-year. Um, Alana, what are your thoughts on this one? Um, so I, ch uh, part of why I felt my program was doable, even though it, it, um, you know, didn't have like the best stipend was because it was a three year program. Um, I knew that that way I'd be able to spread out my, uh, courses. So I'd be taking fewer semester. Um, and that, that way, um, having a part-time job would be more doable. Um, uh, like quick mention of a part, like part of why I went to grad school when I did was I wanted to take a break from waiting tables and like was able to take advantage of um, both on and off campus like jobs in other fields, um, which was more doable because it was a three year program because it was spread out. Um, a thing that I don't know, but something that kind of like kept me from really wanting to go to a two-year program after all was, um, if you're doing a two-year program, your second year is your thesis year. So I, I, my understanding is it would be very, if you're doing that, go in having at least some sense of what you're going to be doing. Um, cause in your second year, again, my understanding is with these, um, with two year programs, you're still finishing up coursework, but that is also your thesis year. Whereas, um, with mine, I was able to, um, have things fall out such that like I loaded up in a second year so that like my last semester I was taking one, uh, one course and doing thesis hours. Um, it did get a little exhausting by the third year. Um, so I, I will say that, but yeah, for, for me, the, the, those are the reasons why I picked a, a three-year program. Yeah. Um, I'm going to speak to this one a little bit as well. Um, and echo some of what you just said, because I was in a kind of unique position where my program went from a two-year to a three-year program while I was in the middle of it. And, and we were given the choice of if we wanted to stay in the two-year or go to the three-year. So I chose to go to the three year, but some of my friends and colleagues chose to stay in the two year. Um, so I'll just kind of outline some of those reasons. So I thought that I wanted to be in a two year program because my whole thing was, I wanna like be able to take this break, but also when I go back to the job market, I want to be able to kind of step back to where I was. I had been working in publishing at that time, wasn't sure if I wanted to go back to it. Um, and I was, I was kind of worried about what was going to happen when I left school. Um, I will say that none of what I thought was going to pan out actually did pan out. And I work in something completely different now. I work in a university because um, I discovered that I really like working with students through teaching. So that's one thing to know also. Like if you have any concerns around what I just described, it's hard to know what your life is going to look like two or three years down the road. So when I got there and I found out that I was going to be able to do three years and I was learning so much and I, was, I felt like I was growing a lot in my craft, I knew that I wanted that third year. Um, I didn't feel ready to go into a thesis in my second year. I think it was really useful for me. I'll echo what Alana said about that third year starting to get a little bit exhausting. Um, there's a point, I think, for a lot of people where they don't always need that MFA culture anymore. And I think it often happens somewhere in that third year. 
I will say that I did have some friends and colleagues and they tended to be people who were a little bit more established than I was. So I got to my program, I think I was 23 and they were um, somewhere in their thirties. Um, and so they'd been working for longer, or were in really committed partnerships and things like that. And they did not take the three year because of life circumstances. Like one of them was like, I know I want to have a kid soon and I want to be able to finish my program and move to the place where I want to like have that child and raise it, for example. So I think part of looking at two and three year programs might also be thinking about how the MFA fits in with your larger life experience and where you want it to sit in terms of that. Um, is there anything else that our panelists wanted to include before we move on to the next question? Okay, awesome. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about location as well and let Adam jump onto this one. How much does location really matter? A lot. And I, uh, Michelle was saying about uh, talking about this in the chat too, that it might even, you know, be in a, a, a bigger factor than prestige for programs too. Um, ultimately, like we're all engaging in writing because it like brings joy to our lives. It makes us happy, right? But it's going to be hard for that happiness of like getting a lot of writing done to offset the unhappiness of being in a place we kind of hate. So like it's, it's, Definitely one of the biggest things to look into beforehand, some of the things that you might want to be looking into, um, the weather for one, um, the culture of the place, population, like is it, are, are you accustomed to like a place like New York or, or are you more interested in something that's a little bit more remote, it's a little bit more secluded. Um, distractions too, I come from New Orleans, which is like the greatest city in the world, but also probably the most distracting city in the world too. And it was very important for me, um, you know, a lot of my friends and family there as, as well as like, like month long Mardi Gras. So like I needed a place that was away from New Orleans um, so I could focus on writing. But at the same time, like if I wanted to do something on the weekends, I, I wanted, you know, somewhere like Wilmington, which had a beach, which was really nice. Um, and then diversity too is really important too. Like, Nobody, nobody wants to be the token anything in a place. Like the best resource for all of these kind of things too are, are current students too. So reach out to them, ask them about these these kind of things. That, that that'll be a great resource. Absolutely. Um, yeah, Michelle. Um, I was going to ask you if you could speak to this a little bit. Yeah, you know, I look back and um, I made the decision I made and I love Brooklyn College and sometimes I do wonder, well, what would have happened had I left New York and had two years where my focus, number one focus really was writing. Um, it's not feasible in New York unless you're incredibly lucky uh, to not be able to work. So I worked throughout my entire program in addition to teaching and it was the decision that ultimately made sense for me. Um, I, I don't regret it. Um, I knew that I didn't want to uproot my life for an MFA program, although, again, sometimes I wonder, should I have? Um, but I didn't. Um, but if your question is, do you need to be in New York? That's where publishing is. That's where agents are. That's where editors are. The answer to that is absolutely no. So if you, for me, I was staying in New York because I'd already lived there for 10 years. My life was there. I had... Um, a, all my friends were there. I had a long-term partner that I was living with. We had a discussion um, and ultimately came to that decision together. Um, but I think the bigger question with this is sometimes people feel like, do I need to be in New York in order to be a writer? And the answer to that is 100% no. Agents travel, editors travel, um, people communicate via email. So if that's your concern, that shouldn't be. Yeah, thank you so much. And then I was going to ask Dantiel also if you had anything to add to this. So basically, just to piggyback off of both what Michelle and Adam said, 100% no, you do not have to be in New York to make this work. I'm in Florida right now, and I have a book coming out next year. It has not, it's, you don't need New York. I mean, that's the great thing about what we do is that you can, I mean, you can't get paid to do it everywhere in a lot of cases, but you can do it from anywhere. And then, you know, you set yourself up. Um, but as far as like jumping off of what Adam said, you want to ask, don't be shy. Um, ask everybody that you can get in contact with. Ask your faculty, hey, do you have students that I can talk to? Or go into draft or like if you see someone they're like, oh, they attend this MFA, message them. I was doing a lot of Facebook messaging being like, hey, um, we don't know each other, but I have, I have questions if you're okay with that. Um, but yeah, just some things to think about is ask them how much they pay for rent. Seriously. I mean, you want to know like what, what can you expect as far as cost of living and that kind of thing. 
Um, if you're going somewhere that is drastically different culturally as well as seasonally from where you're from, like, so I'm from Florida, I went to Madison, Wisconsin, so winter is a whole thing. I have a new vocabulary for cold having moved there, but, you know, ask about those things, you know, um, are the winters particularly tough? Is it, is it particularly isolated climate? Um, is it particularly white? Um, that, that's going to be very important, um, especially if you're a person of color. Yeah, I completely agree with what's been said, and I also just want to add that in some cases, moving to somewhere completely new can also be such a great and generative experience for your writing. So I have lived in Connecticut and New York for my whole life, um, and I moved to Tucson, Arizona without ever seeing um, the city. And I don't necessarily recommend that, and I totally agree with everybody that like finding out what you're kind of getting into before you make that decision is important. But I never thought I was going to love the desert I did. I never thought I was going to start writing about land the way that I did. So I think if, if it seems like a place you'd be interested in um, and you're curious about going there, that might also be a reason to attend that MFA program and think about how that could add to some of your writing as well. Um, I also just want to hop in really quickly and say that um, you shouldn't take stereotypes for places um, as thinking you know about the place. Um, so I know a lot of people, you know, don't want to live in the South, but I'm from the South and I find that there are a lot of stereotypes about the South. Um, yeah, and they're not all true. Um, there, you know, obviously there's definitely racism in the South, but there are also very thriving, um, vibrant communities that are communities of color, of queer people, trans people. So um, definitely talk to actual people about the place before you decide or write it off. 100% want to just agree with you on that one. Um, racism is every, like worldwide. So like, it's not just the South. The South is pretty baller. We have really good food. <laughs> I love it. Um, thank you all so much. Um, our next question is about extracurricular opportunities. So how much do they matter? And when I say that, I'm thinking about like literary journals or organizing readings or other things that you might think of. And if you are thinking about something different, um, if you could just verbalize that for our listeners here. Um, so I'm going to ask Maddie actually to speak to this one. Yeah, so I ran the reading series here for students for a year, and it was a really great experience for me. Um, I found that running readings was something that I enjoyed a lot and something that I want to do in the future. So I think that finding different opportunities are important. I also think, again, considering why you want to go to the MFA is important. If you want to go into working in literary magazines and publishing, this can give you more experience or you can um, kind of try your hand at it if you haven't already. So yeah, I think if that's something that's important to you and something that you want out of your MFA experience, then that's obviously a plus, but again, you can find these things in other ways through different communities as well. So I wouldn't say it's make or break, but um, it is something to take advantage of. Thank you. And Alana, do you have any thoughts on this? Yes. Um, so uh, I guess two things. Um, one, um, something I wish I did was have like hobbies or like extracurriculars that had literally, or I mean, that had nothing to do with what I was doing on campus. Um, like I had a friend who was in a burlesque troupe and like took dance classes or like people who did da like dance. And I was like, and whereas on my end, I was like reading for the lit journal, running the reading series and just like, I or like going to readings for fun. And like, yes, I really appreciate the chance to like deep dive into that. Um, I don't know that I would have gotten that chance otherwise, but also it is really, really helpful to have a life outside of your program and the even like the, the literary extracurriculars. Um, if for no other reason, then those other activities can inform your writing. Um, that said, in terms of the um, like literary offerings, um, for me, I came in like having uh, co-edited just like a really small um, online journal. So I knew that what I wanted experience in was organizing readings. Um, so it is kind of helpful to um, consider this as like a time in your writing life. Um, so think about what you want to do like beyond the um, 
MFA experience? Do you want to get experience running readings so that you can offer them in, in your community where you wherever you live? Like, that's great. Um, like, think of these, um, the term service is loaded and like literary citizenship also loaded. Um, wonderful or like important discussions to be had. I, I, I can't like fast enough right now, but um, yeah, just uh, uh, be part of your literary community wherever you are. Um, to, uh, if, if, uh, if, if you want as much as you can. Um, final thoughts are just like, it was also really cool to, um, like I was a reader for um, uh, CU's Lit Mag Timber. Um, we also have a, a small press on campus, uh, Sabido. So I was able both to do the, I'm blanking on what not wine submissions are, but like the regular submissions for uh, journal slush piles. Um, and then I also had the experience of doing like blind manuscript readings for, um, for uh Sabido press for its annual prize um so like really like i don't it is also to your benefit to get these experiences so that when you're the one submitting stuff to journals you can see what you're up against so that you are um when you're at a point where you're submitting manuscripts to, to contests you know that like if you're submitting to a university press hey it's going to be a bunch of tired grad students in a room kind of thing but yeah i love it thank you um the next question that we have are what questions should some of these applicants be asking students who are currently in the program? Um, and I was wondering if Dantiel could speak to this a little bit. So Michelle posted a really great um, resource in the, in the group chat that was pretty much like every question that I was like, you need to ask. But on top of asking, you know, the general questions about cost of living and that kind of deal, ask them how often do they meet with their professors outside of workshop? Ask them how, how responsive are, you know, their professors outside of workshop? I, um, I taught for a semester um, at a university this past fall. And um, when I got there, you know, I was there because one of the professors was on sabbatical. And um, what I ended up hearing from a lot of the students was that, oh, you know, you know, they don't really get that much feedback from their professors or, you know, it seems like the professors checked out, you know, that kind of thing. So that, you know, that can really affect how, how well you're able to do in the program and how much you benefit from learning craft. Cause that's what you're there for. Your, your professor doesn't have to write the same kind of thing that you write, but they, they should be there to help you do what you do want to do better. Um, so ask how responsive do they, you know, do they meet with their professors often outside of workshop? That could be really important. Um, piggybacking off of that one, ask, do the MFAs interact with each other outside of workshop? Um, in my MFA program, we got together like all the time to have like potlucks, potlucks and salons where we're reading new work and we're just generally hanging out, like going to readings, making, making the effort to have that bond really drastically can affect um, your two or three years in a program. So just asking questions like that. Do they bring agents to meet you? Um, do they help you with query letters? How do they set you up for resources outside of the program? So like for my program, we had a life after the MFA talk where, you know, alumni would come um, and talk and they gave us a huge packet with all these sample query letters and proposal letters and CVs. So you know how to structure your stuff when you're going out into the job market or just trying to do different um, opportunities in that way. Um, do they give you a list of like grants and fellowships and you know that kind of thing that you can apply to so those are questions that are really important to ask because your mfa program is going to be like a blip like whether you're there for two three four years i mean honestly i was like i blinked and then i was graduated so like you need to be prepared for what you're how you're going to sustain your writing life once it's over absolutely um and then maddie i was going to ask if you had any thoughts on this one yeah, I totally agree. And I think throughout this whole conversation, we've been bringing up questions to ask, right, about, um, you know, cost of living, is the stipend livable, the community. Um, so yeah, I think that there are lots of questions that you should ask. But yeah, I think that in general, the two most important things to think about are um, how is my writing going to grow and what community am I going to have? So asking specifically, just ask students how has your writing grown? How has your writing been supported? Um, thinking about that, I think is important. And then also, yeah, thinking about what's the community like? Um, asking students, I think is incredibly important too, because there are some things that the faculty legally cannot tell you. Um, so like sometimes shit goes down in the program and it gets covered up, um, which it, you know, sucks to find out when you get to an MFA program. So asking ahead of time is important. Um, 
just about, yeah, the community. What are the faculty like? How are the faculty student um, interactions? What are the other students like? Um, yeah, I think thinking about that and thinking about your own personal safety and how you're gonna feel in a program um, is important. And um, students are generally pretty upfront about that. So I would ask them about that as well. Thank you. And really quickly, it might be a red flag if you don't have any time to talk to students outside of like faculty faculty being there. Like if you're like, if they're like, oh yeah, you can talk, but like they're kind of like covering, that might be like a situation where you want to like privately message that person like, hey, what's going down? Because you know, if you can say one thing in front of faculty, like if things are like whatever, but like getting them to be like, hey, can you be honest with me about blah, blah, blah. I mean, that's really important. So talking to students without faculty present. Absolutely. Um, I used to do a lot of phone calls with incoming students. Um, and I think I was like relatively honest with them as much as I could be over the phone. Um, what I mean by that is like, you can't obviously take them to the place and show them everything. But as much as I could describe to them over the phone was was great because we were having this one on one interaction. Um, so the next thing I want to talk about is for those who may have made their decisions or are getting close to making a decision, what should they actually expect from an MFA program that no one told them when they were applying? Um, and I will ask Alana that one first. Okay, so in no particular order, um, if your school has a union versus if it does not have a union, you are going to have different experiences. Um, know that you are like, whether it is you're on a fellowship and you're being paid for like your artistic labor, your in intellectual labor, whether you're being paid for your teaching labor. Um, if you can um, go to a school that has a grad student union, I would highly recommend it. I went to one that did not. Um, just so it uh, just just know that um, that can make a difference. Um, I will say too that um, I'm a firm believer that the whole time to write as part of your MFA thing is a lie. Um, just know that um, t teaching is going to take up a lot of your time. Um, we've kind of talked about that before. Just know that, um, yeah, that's going to take up a lot of time. Um, I guess the other real thing is that you have to self-advocate it really sucks. It really sucks. Um, but I, I unfortunately found it to be kind of helpful to have an almost adversarial relationship with like the university as a construct. So just know that um, unfortunately a lot of the time you are not going to like, um, uh, you're going to have to like Google stuff you're gonna have to like be your own advocate. Don't, uh, you know, look at what the, um, read your handbook, your grad student handbook, um, read what the, the graduation requirements are and like keep track of that. Um, <laughs> sorry, I don't know if this is getting too dark or weird, but also document everything that gets discussed with professors and administrators. Keep as much as you can to e uh, it to, in email as possible. Um, uh, yeah, um, those are just some, some practical, uh, lessons, um, that, yeah, that, uh, were learned over the course of attending this school. Yeah, that's really good advice. Um, and then I was going to ask Dantiel if she had anything to add here. I feel like I've pretty much said some form of like what you should expect in like other areas of this chat. So the only thing that I would add to that is, you know, um, look to see how do they support their MFAs after they graduate. You know, are they like posting their work? You know, oh, they, you know, are they posting their publications? That kind of thing. Are they like interested in, can you email them and be like, hey, do you know anybody? You know, can you still use them for resources after you, you know, graduate? So I would say to keep that in mind. Perfect. And then Michelle, did you have anything to add with this one? pretty much covered it so I I will pass. <laughs> okay that sounds great we're actually heading towards the end of our time and the end of our presentation here so we're in good shape. Um, this was a question that came out of MFA draft if we can just um, answer it quickly Dantiel, um, if this person didn't end up liking the program could they reply, reapply to another school and, and how would they navigate those letters of recommendation? Yeah, so really quickly, I haven't personally, I didn't personally experience this, but um, I had a student when I was teaching who um, last semester and she wanted to reapply to programs and I was kind of helping her work on her application. So the number one thing is you, you can definitely reapply. It's not like spoken about a lot, but it is 
kind of common, I think, for people to get into a program, realize it's not a great fit, and then want to reapply. Um, I would say that when you are doing your application and your, you know, your little cover letter, um, what is it called? Uh, st personal statement, your SOP. When you're doing that, there's no reason to hide that you are currently in an MFA program. Like say like, hey, you know, I'm currently in this program, you know, and then you can say what you're looking for instead of trying to like hide that you're in one or, and don't, and also literary world is very small. So try not to use um, derogatory speech in the reason why you're leaving. Just kind of frame it around like the positive. You realize that the opportunities, opportunities that you're looking for, you could or a better fit for the program that you're applying to instead. Um, how to navigate letters of rec. Yeah, because that'll be tricky because you can't really ask the people, you can't ask your current professor. So think about asking um, anybody you've met in writing groups. Think about, you know, people that can speak to your characters, basically just like you would regular letters of recommendation as if you were applying for the first time. Just people who are going to give you a really positive character or writing um, letter for you, but it is common. It does happen and it's not the end of the world if you get to your MFA and realize that oh I actually don't want to be here um, It happens Absolutely um, And then our last question here um, Alana, I'm gonna volley this to you Although I know we chatted about it a little bit already But finding ways to engage outside of the English department out of school. Is that important? Is it common? Yes, um, I will say for me, I'm coming from a perspective of also being heavily affiliated with my university's program in Jewish studies. Um, as a result of that, there were like ample funding opportunities um, through that. Um, I also served as a research assistant for um, one of the professors in that program. Um, also just like talk to, uh, I guess, talk to the program admins um, for English to see if there are other teaching opportunities outside of the English department. For example, um, ITA 17th century global history, the history department was pulling like English people. Um, so just uh, try and ask about other funding opportunities, um, both in terms of like your work and like uh, specific like grants or fellowships for like summer funding. Um, I will say too, I got really big into, um, uh, what's it called, grad student government. Um, and for me, it was really helpful to get like a holistic picture of what was going on at the university, um, to hear about stuff going on across a bunch of disciplines. And I'm just, I, I don't know, I'm just big on like, if you're part of a community, do what you can to, to be part of it. Um, uh, and also, like from a, from a selfish point of view, grad student government gave out travel grant funding, and I had graded a ton of those. So by the time I went to apply, I was like, "All right, piece of cake." So yeah, it's also a, a, much like doing the extracurriculars off campus. It's it's another good way to kind of like bring in new things to your life and meet other people. Thank you so much. Um, so at this point, we were gonna do more questions, um, but we've kind of done that through the chat already. Um, again, if you feel like you, something didn't get answered, feel free to email me. Um, but I wanna just say thank you again to our brilliant panel. Um, they're all here and you know, follow them on the internet. They're all great writers and great people. And I just wanna thank, say thank you so much for all of you for being here and listening and for all of you um, participating and you know best of luck to everyone with their writing and wherever they're gonna end up in the next year yeah and thank you Ishadi for organizing this and putting this together thank you all right thank you everyone we'll talk later